good morning to you. A good, fruitful, fantastic flashback Friday, if you will. Uh, thank you for being here with us for what we like to call our hour of power. This is the Preterist Power Hour, a program provided to you, excuse me, a program provided to you through the Power of Preterism Network, which endeavors to lead in clarity, healing, and strategy regarding the front lines of reformation and revival in our current day. Uh, I thank you for being here with me. I get to be your host for the next hour or so. I'm Michael Miano. I am the pastor of the Blue Point Bible Church. I serve as the director of the Power of Preterism Network, and it's exciting to see the power of preterism in our day, and I pray that you have continued to see that as well, that you have continued to follow along with us through the resources that we provide, the information we provide, the studies we provide, and that you find yourself constantly giving glory to God regarding uh, what's happening in your life. Prayerfully, you can find uh, an individual a part in this corporate reality we celebrate called eternal life. And uh, yeah, I'm just very praiseworthy this morning. Uh, maybe some of you as well. I have Dr. Don K. Preston's voice kind of reverberating in the back of my brain as I've been listening to him. I know I heard Edward mention uh, in an off uh, off program discussion where he said that he's been listening to the morning musings. So Edward, I know you share the same sentiment with me. I've been watching the Joel McDermott and Don Preston debate that was had in 2012. We talked about this on Monday. Uh, I did share a, the links for you to go ahead and listen to the audio and join with me in that debate. Uh, many of you may be already doing that. It's a three, three video debate or three, au three audio clip debate. There we go. And uh, the first night, the second night, and then, of course, the Q&A. And I'm, I find myself at about 20 more minutes in the Q&A. Uh, so you would imagine I've been listening to Don at every moment that I can get this whole week, uh, just kind of grueling through that debate. And I say grueling because we talked about the Steve Gregg debate. And the one thing I liked about the Steve Gregg debate was that it was in pieces. You know, there was a lot of pieces, a lot of 20-minute segments, if you will. Uh, however, with the Joel McDermott sessions, it's 35 minute sessions from each of them. And a lot can be said in 35 minutes. And uh, I'll talk a little bit about that as we get in on the program today. My goal, we've been reviewing the debates. Uh, again, we have a lot of different things we could talk about with the power of preterism. Uh, I have many interviews I'm still working on. Uh, so just to let you know that we haven't given up on our interviews. Uh, we have other resources that we've been looking into, things that have been happening. For example, uh, two weeks ago was the 2022 Spirit and Life Lectures. So uh, I'm, I'm hoping to kind of catalog them and encourage folks to go review them and then maybe even have some of the guests from that conference uh, be with us here for the Preterist Power Hour. Uh, however, more particularly, we've been looking in on these debates. And I've mentioned that uh, we're going to narrow down, you know, we're going to kind of go chronologically. I'll share some of this on the program today. We're going to go chronologically through the debate starting in 2012 uh, with the, the Don Preston and Joel McDermott debate, uh, which, again, I just mentioned. Uh, then we've already kind of stepped ahead of ourselves in listening to the Steve Gregg debate. There's also a debate that I participated in 2012 that I may bring, might bring up. Uh, many of you have seen it, the Defiance Conference 2012. I sat on a sort of round table with other pastors and was able to explain the full preterist view and show the problems with the futurist view. So I will be uh, bringing folks' attention back. What we're looking to do on the Power of Preterism blog site is actually create a sort of uh, a chronological debate timeline. Now, it won't include all the debates, but it will include the debates that we review here. And then what we'll do is we'll provide the review videos uh, to the debates in the sort of like a sub column there. So I'll look forward to that resource provided to you at powerofpreterism.wordpress.com, which is our blog site. And of course, you could just simply visit powerofpreterism.com and gain access to all the information, all the resources that we do and more. So I've already introduced myself. Let's go ahead and open in a word of prayer. Uh, putting the Lord first, praising him for setting our eyes on him this morning and uh, asking him to go ahead and do his mighty work of going before us and providing edification to his glory. Let's go ahead and pray. Mighty God, Lord, every time I come before you, I think of all the different titles, Lord, that we could use to praise you, all the different things that you've shown us, Lord, in our individual experience, our corporate experience of knowing you. This morning, Lord, we ask individually that you would speak to us, that you would give us a title of your name to speak to our reality today, Lord, that we would praise you for being a mighty God, a wonderful counselor, the Prince of Peace, an everlasting Father, the Lord of the Sabbath, the Lord of healing, Lord, whatever it might be. Mark that out for us. Of course, Lord, corporately, we have a host of different ways we could approach you, and we thank you for that. We thank you, Lord, that you have provided everything pertaining to life and godliness. 
We trust you for the increase. We pray that we have opportunity to see healing of the nations take place right in our individual experience of living out this beautiful eternal life. Go before us, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. As I mentioned, I'm excited to kind of jump in on things. Flashback Friday, uh, what we've been doing here is having Monday and Friday programs. So throughout the week, I sort of encourage you to take a look at some of the resources that are shared through the Power of Preterism Network's Facebook page, or maybe even visit our blog and dig through the resources and find some things that you can be using to build up what God is doing in and through you. Many of you know I often highlight 2 Peter chapter 1. 2 Peter chapter 1 gets at, in my estimation, the heart of a Christian life. And the heart of a Christian life is to be possessing and increasing. As many of you know, I often bring up our preterist ethic is that we are not watching and waiting. We are possessing and increasing for the glory of God uh, and or possessing and increasing so that, to use the phrase appropriately, that we would be effective and fruitful in our use of the knowledge of God. Let me remind you this morning, just yesterday in prayer, I thought about this. The goal of our faith is what? 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 5, the goal of our faith is this, love from a pure heart, a good conscience, and a sincere faith. I pray that all that we do builds you up in those three things, love from a pure heart. Matter of fact, let's speak to love here for a moment. Just going to dig up my Facebook page here. Uh, just this morning, I shared a quote that I found to be uh, encouraging in regards to love, and I want to go ahead and share it with you. Because perfectly we know and we agree with what the Apostle Paul said in Corinthians, where he said that you can have all these different things, but if you do not have love, you don't have anything. Love is the source of it all. If I might go ahead and share with you this quote. Bear with me one moment. And this is from Francis Chan. Many of you may be familiar. He's a pretty popular evangelical Christian pastor, author, etc. He said, when love is shallow, all it takes is something as trivial as a disagreement to divide us. How beautiful is that this morning? Again, as preterists, we know there's disagreement all around us, yet we are called to love deeply. I wrote for my, my sort of commentary on that quote from Francis Chan was, we are to love deeply, struggle together, and aim for grace at all costs. That is in our families, our marriages, our friendships, and our communities. And I mean our community of faith, as well as our community at large, you know, a common love uh, that we need to have for each other uh, truly needs to be magnified through the church. Amen. And I happen to believe the church is the source of all blessings, uh, source of what God wanted to provide in this world to provide the healing of the nations. So uh, I happen to believe that uh, it's important for us to get it right. It's important for us to be that light to the nation. And of course, lest we think that this is something in and of ourselves, let's mark out that it's God's work in and through us. So what he's going to do, what he began, he will accomplish. We see that right there in scripture. So lest, not, uh, lest we be uh, you know, desperate or seem depressed because we don't see the healing happening the way we think it should, always remember, it's the Lord's work in and through you. So uh, love from a pure heart, a good conscience. And again, many of you know, a couple of months back, I preached at a, a church, uh, what was it, Prospect Baptist Church in Seligen, Alabama. And if you're interested in getting the link to that message, I would love to send it to you. And I preached about called to conviction that each of us individually, yes, each of us individually within this corporate body are compelled and called to conviction. We are to have our own convictions. Now, that does not mean that someone's conviction might be the same as yours, but that doesn't negate the fact that we are called to have conviction. Uh, let every man be convinced in his own mind is what the Apostle Paul had said. And uh, that's so important, especially, matter of fact, this coming Sunday to wet your senses here at the Blue Point Bible Church, I'll be preaching about the mind of Christ. What does it mean in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, where it says that we are, you know, not of the flesh, but we are those have us who are spiritual, and we have the mind of Christ. So we're going to lean in on that this coming Sunday at the Blue Point Bible Church. So there you have it. In order to have the mind of Christ, we must have a good conscience. So love from a pure heart, a good conscience, a conscience that has challenged ex excel, ex its self excuse me, talking over myself today, a conscience that has challenged itself, a conscience that has examined itself, a conscience that knows how and why the convictions that it has are being built up the way they are. And then lastly, a sincere faith. And a sincere faith, in my estimation, is provided through the love from a pure heart and the maintaining of a good conscience so that you might know you have a sincere faith. So just want to encourage you in those things. And of course, seeking, searching, studying, and proving uh, is 
the apologetic, I often encourage folks toward having a sincere faith. Have you truly sought these things out? Have you truly studied them out? Uh, seek, search, excuse me. So have you truly sought these things out seeking? Have you truly searched them out? Have you truly, you know, uh, did what the noble Bereans did and, and, you know, search the scriptures to see if what is being said is true? Have you, um, have you studied these things to study, study to show yourself approved? Have you studied these things out? And have you proved them? Again, the Apostle Paul says to prove all things, hold fast to that which is good and abstain from that which is bad or evil. So uh, prayerfully, you're, you're walking worthy of those things. And that's what, you know, I don't mind that I just spent a good 10 minutes talking about this because that's what we're supposed to be getting at. Granted, you know, prayer is truth is beautiful. The fact that it provides an amazing foundation, an amazing apologetic, uh, you know, for truth, uh, there's so much more to the Christian life than just focusing on study. So I never want that to be uh, negated or to seem like we don't think that's of utmost importance. Now, this morning, uh, again, I've mentioned the debate review. So you could go ahead and go to the power of preterism.wordpress.com and you can find links to, and you can also read my written review of the 2013 Preston Gregg debate. So I encourage you to go over there and do that, mark out some of the issues. What I'm trying to do is uh, develop a healthy debate review mentality. And two things I might mention in that regard for your edification. I mentioned this on Monday, but I'm going to repeat it again today. When you review these debates, first off, you want to take in consideration uh, who's in the affirmative and who's in the negative. And in many of the debates, there's two people in the affirmative and two negative. So you want to ask yourself, if this person is affirming their view in this 35 minutes, what are they affirming? And then what are they negating when they go against the other person's view? How are they negating that other person's view? Uh, but again, it's always important to pay attention to the affirmative. So what was affirmed and the negative is not supposed to be a random negative. You know, that's like me saying, the, uh, the sky is blue and you say, but Mike drives a black car. Well, okay, that, that's something totally different that we have to debate uh, you know, or decide on. Uh, however, let's focus on the sky is blue. Can you prove me right or wrong from the sky is blue? And then we have to stay there in the negative. And then the affirmative, now let's say uh, somebody made the affirmative, well, I believe Mike's car is black. Well, then now we, my job would be to either prove them right or wrong, if I'm in the negative, of course, I'm proving them wrong, that my car is not black. But it's important to keep in mind the affirmative and the negative. So that being said, uh, the second thing I would bring up would be summarizing. So when you listen to these debates, you need to ask yourself, how would I summarize what Don Preston's saying, you know, to use the debate I've been focused on, and what is Joel McDermott saying? And how do their views sort of compete with one another? And then summarize it in maybe three or four paragraphs. That's what I've been seeking to do, and that's what I'm going to endeavor to do as we go through these debates. So I encourage you, go visit the Steve Gregg review. Uh, you'll see I did that already. And I'm walking, uh, by the end of this weekend, I will have a, a review written up regarding the Joel McDermott and Don Preston debate that was had in 2012. I do hope that there are other contributors to the thought. If you've reviewed that debate, if you watched that debate, I hope to hear from you. And I hope you might either write me, talk here on the Preterist Power Hour, uh, you know, and, and let me know your thoughts. I know some have written debates, uh, written some comments on Facebook in regards to that debate. For example, um, uh, Preterist Voice had commented that he, he believes that Joel's arguments were very lacking, which actually I have some clips I'm going to share with you here in a moment that I would agree. Um, you know, following this debate, uh, I think I mentioned this on Monday, I'll mention it again. Uh, one of my critiques of this, this debate, the Joel McDermott debate, would be the amount of time. Uh, I think that, you know, we need to make our arguments a bit more concise. And while the Steve Gregg debate, many, I guess uh, it was said quite a few times in that debate, um, I'll make you laugh right now. So here I have my computer and on my computer, I have the Joel McDermott debate kind of right here on the screen. And then when I get in my car, I have the Don Preston and Steve Gregg MP3 playing in the, uh, the, CD, the, the what is it? The CD uh, uh, drive there. So as you would imagine, I've been really uh, immersed in these debates and thinking through these things, trying to find consistency of thought regarding this partial preterist paradigm or what I like to refer to as the partial preterist hideout. And, uh, yeah, so I've been listening to both and um, too much information for me uh, in the Joel McDermott debate, too much having to follow these different trails where I don't find a lot of negating of each other's views. There might be a quick, you know, re reference back to something Don said in the negative, but then it, he kind of goes on his own uh, spiel there. So that's been a little frustrating for me. Um, what I'd like to do is uh, if anybody has any thoughts in regards to... Uh, 
the Joel McDermott debate, please get in touch with me. And as I mentioned, I'll make my thoughts available soon. Um, also, Joel McDermott and Don Preston both wrote books uh, after their debate. So what I've been doing, not only listening to these debates, but also so you have Steve Gregg, real quickly, I'll return back to that. Steve Gregg debated Don in 2013. You can go ahead and read my review of his debate. Steve Gregg wrote a book in August 2022, Why Not Full Preterism? So what we need to see is if the things that he did not explain in that debate 10 years ago or nine years ago, how does he deal with them now nine years later in his book that he actually had the audacity to write against the full preterist view? And we want to be gracious in our approach, but we also want to be demanding. You know, if you're going to write a book against the view, then yeah, you need to be able to explain yourself and you need to deal with the points that you debated nine years ago that many felt were lacking. Uh, that being said, the same thing with Joel McDermott. Uh, Joel McDermott, now he wrote a book almost immediately after his debate, and so did Don. So I'm going to look forward to reading their reviews just as much as I'm going back to uh, Steve Gregg's book. I'm going to dig up Joel McDermott's post-debate book and also Don Preston's post-debate book. And I believe that that will provide for an exhaustive uh, understanding of these debates. Many of you might know and probably already heard, I'm writing a book, Full Preterism, if not, why not? And in that book, I'm looking to kind of summarize a lot of these debates and some of the particular details that keep coming up in these debates with futurists or partial preterists. And I'm hoping this book will be a, an opportunity to win some minds to the power of preterism. And uh, one thing I'll say, the debate with Don and Joel was a lot about the resurrection. Uh, ultimately, that was the major point of the resurrection and how that's being defined. Steve Gregg and Joel McDermott, both being partial preterists, have entirely different worldviews when you listen to them talk. Joel is more of, uh, I'd say, a full partial preterist, where he puts a lot of stock in AD 70. He's qualified verses in AD 70. He wrote a book, Jesus First Jerusalem, uh, you know, explaining AD 70. Um, and then you have uh, Steve Gregg, who was more of a, he doesn't know if this verse would fit in AD 70. So there was a lot of, a lot of difference between those two men, and uh, that needs to be noted. So in my uh, sort of studies here, one link I might provide to you uh, would be in 2017, I wrote up a thing called my notebook review of the resurrection of the dead. And what I had done was I went through probably about two years of, uh, of notes I had in my notebook leading up to 2017 about the resurrection of the dead. And uh, Don Preston, for example, in the Q&A uh, of the Joel McDermott debate, Don Preston mentioned the many facets of the resurrection. And my mind immediately went to this article I had read by William Bell uh, in regards to the resurrection. So I provided those notes and that blog. I will provide that in our update for today at thepowerofpreterism.wordpress.com, where you could go ahead and read that link and read that review of uh, William Bell's article, or my notes from William Bell's article. Um, also, talking about debates, before I kind of launch into going through some of the details from the Joel McDermott debate, um, we had talked last year in July, uh, Edward and I, when we were co-hosting together, uh, we talked about Max King. Many of you may remember, I wrote a written review, which you could find on the internet, uh, about the book, Give Me This Mountain by Tim King, Max King's son. And in that book, he gives a healthy, hearty foundation for the history of preterism. And uh, in there, he talked a bit about Max King's debates with uh, Gus Nichols and Jim McGeegan. And you can find them on the internet. They're sort of hard to find. They were had in 1973 and 1975. Uh, so you would imagine they weren't, it wasn't the days where we were going live on Zoom and YouTube. Um, however, you can sort of dig up some of the, the resources from those debates. Uh, I will provide the link to both my review of that book, Give Me This Mountain, as well as a link where we had talked on the Preterist Power Hour about those debates that Max King had. So that brings you from 2012 all the way back to 1973. And if you know of any debates, by the way, this is for the uh, social media world. If you know of any debates happening between 1973 and 2012 that you have found online that you believe we need to review in regards to preterism, get me that information, please. Uh, also, if you know of any debates that you feel we need to highlight from 2012 forward, uh, many have submitted some already. Uh, I ask you to go ahead and do that and, and let me know what other debates. I think those of you that are commenting on Facebook, sending me emails, um, I'd love to keep adding to our list so that we would get a hearty review of these things. And now we're not going to do necessarily the review here on the program. Uh, I would encourage you to review the resources and then join me here on the program. And uh, whether you do or you don't, I'd love to hear from you. 
uh, in regards to your thoughts about the things I share or the things that happen in that debate. I mentioned the published book. All right, so let's jump into it today. Let's kind of get into some thoughts that I have for us from this Don Preston debate with Joel McDermott. And I believe this will probably consume majority of our time. So what I'll do is I'll share some clips, encourage you to listen, and then I'll open up for fee feedback on those things. Because again, I think I've already mentioned quite a bit this morning that you could already dive into and dig up and uh, be edified throughout the weekend. So the first clip I'm going to show you, let me go ahead and find my notes here. I believe this is video number one, so just bear with me. I'm going to go ahead and dig it up. The unfortunate part is I think I just gave up my spot and where I was in the debate. Okay, so we're at... All right, we're all gonna put our listening caps on. go. The ceremonies of the old covenant were done away with. Yes, there's a definitive moment here when this age gives age way to the age to come. But the, again, that doesn't say anything about the finality of the resurrection, does it? Don says, well, there is no administration without Torah, and that's what passed away. And therefore, there's no more administration. What in the world do you think Jesus did? Jesus Christ is the administration of the new covenant. That's why the Bible calls him the mediator of the new covenant. In his body, he fulfilled all the Old Testament ceremonies. And Again, don't think that fulfillment means done, gone, over with, out of here. Those ceremonies and rites live on to this day in the body of Jesus Christ who fulfilled them in his body. Therefore, that, writing of hand, that handwriting of ordinances was blotted out. We don't have to worry about that. We don't have to worry about circumcision. Thank the Lord. And yet the New Testament is filled with citations of Old Testament, including the Old Testament case laws for things like uh, paying pastors or paying ministers, uh, very obscure things like this. Love your neighbor as yourself, the second most quoted Old Testament passage in the New Testament. Jesus says this is the summary of the law. Well, if every jot and tittle's gone in the way that Don says, then you've got to throw out love your neighbor as yourself too, because that was part of Leviticus. And you've got to throw out love the Lord your God with all your heart and soul and mind and strength, because that's Deuteronomy 4, or Deuteronomy 6. Folks, you've got to be careful about, as I said in the beginning of my opening statement, absolutizing words and then trying to build these doctrines on them and then trying to equate them all across Scripture. Scripture's not put together like that. It's put together in a much more artistic way. And by that, I'm not saying, oh, there's all these variegations floating around out there. No, that's not the point. It is, remember what I said, harmony, symphony, Order. There is order in time, and it will end. And there is one overarching theme through all of it, and it is the coming of the Messiah. That theme begins in Genesis 3.15, when the promised servant is said, this is going to come, crush the head of the serpent, and have his heel bruised. Now, you could have never gotten the fullness of that just from that one verse, but that theme is played out from creation to revelation. And it involves the removal of a curse, and that curse is not removed. Uh, there may have been some things that Don has emphasized that I missed. If that's the case, please do not get the idea that I am, as he says, totally ignoring them. I took notes at a feverish pace because he talks at a feverish pace, and uh, which is 
I'll stop us there. So, and again, we would agree, you know, Don does present a whole lot of information uh, in every one of his presentations. Many of you know, I often talk about that, that, you know, it baffles me that a futurist would even sit at the seat uh, where, you know, Don Preston has just presented an affirmative for full preterism. I don't know how you can sit there and say, I'm going to even follow that, you, you know, and get up there. And you, you, so far, if you've watched the Steve Gregg debate, if you watch no other debates between other than the Steve Gregg debate and this Joel McDermott debate, you should see the problem right away. It's very clear. So that's one of the reasons, by the way, I've told folks to go and review the, the Steve Gregg debate with Don Preston, because if you're a partial preterist, I don't know how you can stay there, you know, uh, by listening to Steve Gregg blunder and make some errors in regards to the view. Same thing here with Joel McDermott. Uh, Joel McDermott, all throughout the debate, it's, he's teaching full preterist things we already know. That became frustrating for me. Uh, we don't believe that, you know, there are some aberrant views within uh, full preterism in Christianity, for that matter, that believe that when things are fulfilled, they mean they cease to exist. Uh, we don't believe that. We believe fulfillment provides something else. So I, obviously we know that, you know, when the old was waxing away, it was going to provide the new. When the old was going to be fulfilled, the jots and tittles of the old, it was going to provide the new. And Don Preston, all throughout this debate, again, I encourage you to watch, uh, listen to this debate with Joel McDermott. All throughout this debate, Don Preston highlights the problem with sort of saying, oh, well, this stuff was already fulfilled, or even as Joel just mentioned there, it was all fulfilled in Jesus Christ in his death, burial, and resurrection. Uh, Don Preston shows throughout this whole debate why that doesn't make sense, why that does not follow with the symphony or the narrative of scripture. Uh, Joel, in the beginning of the debate, he tried to muddy the waters, so to speak, by saying that the full preterist uh, is guilty of making the Bible into an erector set which again, we often highlight the problem with, you know, that proof texting mentality there. That's what has led to futurism. You know, you go talk to the average futurist out there, the average Christian for that matter, and you ask them about, you know, different details in the Bible. Some of them can cite little Bible verses, but nobody can put together a narrative of what the whole Bible from that very part that Joel was talking about there with Adam and Eve in the garden and how that relates to the conclusion of the biblical story. What is God talking about? And the average Christian doesn't know this, uh, the average Christian is guilty of putting together unfortunate erector sets. Dare I say that Christian teachers, uh, scholars, if you will, are guilty of doing that, uh, putting together these erector sets that do not cohesively come together. I would say that Steve Gregg and Joel McDermott are guilty of creating an erector set out of scripture that doesn't work with a cohesive narrative. Uh, again, there's, the, yeah, this was fulfilled in AD 70, but matter of fact, I have some other clips I want to show you uh, that lead in on this. Now, this is going to be in the Q&A portion. If I might encourage you, of course, I believe you should listen to this whole debate. The whole debate altogether, I believe, is about 15 hours. <laughs> uh, just to let you know, that, that might be exaggerating, about 12 hours. Uh, so um, debate number one, uh, debate night number one here, as you see on the screen, this was two hours and 15, no, altogether, I'm sorry, altogether, this video is two hours, three hours. Then you have debate number two, another hour and 28 minutes. Uh, then you have the Q&A, which I believe is another three hours. So quite a bit of information. I would encourage you to watch the whole thing. However, if you don't watch anything else in this debate, I ask you to go to debate number two. You'll see it's uh, number seven, 07 debate two, it's titled. And again, if you go to the Joel McDermott link I shared on our page, the, uh, the Power of Preterism WordPress site, you'll find I, I provided the links one, two, and three. So I'd encourage you to watch video number two and go all the way to the end. Again, this is for those folks that want to just, you know, I don't want to listen to this stuff for hours on end. So go all the way to the end of video number two and listen to Don Preston's last presentation and followed by Joel's last presentation. Uh, there, I think they're both about 25 minutes each. Uh, again, you'll see the problem right there. It's right there before you. In my estimation, that's all you need to listen to in that debate to see the issues. However, if you want to listen to the whole debate, I encourage you to do that as well. Uh, go over to the Q&A and you'll find some interesting comments. Let me go ahead and share some of them with you real quickly here. The first one we're going to talk about is many of us have heard this text, the flesh and blood, flesh and blood will not inherit the kingdom of God. Now, unfortunately, I know many have used this to say that physical bodies will not go into heaven. And I don't believe that's what the text is saying at all. While I don't believe that, I don't believe that physical bodies will go into heaven. Um, I also don't believe that the text is saying anything necessarily against that. that that's not the context of what's going on in 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 15. So that being said, let's go ahead and listen to this little Q&A discussion between Joel and Don. And I want you to pay attention to the way Don responds and the way Joel responds to these questions.
Now, real quickly, you don't have to strain your ears to try to hear the questions. They are going to repeat the question and then respond to it. Well, I don't see that as literally talking about, <laughs> literally talking about the flesh and blood of your body, obviously. I think it's talking about the flesh and blood under the fallen system. That is, the fallen flesh and blood that we're constantly told throughout Scripture uh, has to do with fleshly lusts and those types of things. I think it also has to do with Israel after the flesh. We know that ultimately the promise was not to Israel after the flesh. It came through Israel after the flesh. It was to them in a sense that it was uh, uh, to them in the Mosaic Covenant. But ultimately the, the promise was through faith in Abraham. Well, what happens when John the Baptist comes? Even with the Abrahamic promise, it was to him and his seed. And G both Jesus and John the Baptist are telling the people of that time period, uh, the Jews of that time period, don't think to yourselves that you're children of Abraham just because you're his flesh and blood. Because God can raise up from these stones children of Abraham. And of course we find out in Galatians chapter 3 that the real seed of Abraham is singular. It's Jesus Christ. And his posterity is all those who believe in him through faith, not his flesh. And so I think that's being loaded in. And keep in mind there was tremendous Jew and Gentile controversy going on in, in all of the, Paul's epistles, including 1 Corinthians. And when he's bringing this in, he's contrasting uh, that promise or that covenant, if you will, with the future covenant. That doesn't mean flesh and blood literally cannot inhabit the kingdom of heaven. It just has to be glorified bodies. Uh, there is this distinction that follows right thereafter between what is translated as natural bodies and spiritual bodies. But that's not actually what the text says. The Greek word is uh, psuchikon. A lot of people confuse that for physikon and translate it as natural physical. Physikon, where we get our word physics or physical or physical or stuff like that. But the word is psuchikon, very similar but different, and it refers to the psyche, the soul. All through the New Testament, it's translated as soul or life. So now you have a little bit different contrast between the two types of bodies. Okay, One in the first Adam is a soul body, a psychical body. The new Adam is a spiritual body. Well, how different is that? And is that really contrasting the flesh versus the non-flesh? I don't think it's quite that distinct. I think there are other ideas being loaded in here. And it's easy to look on the surface and make this, contra this uh, distinction between the two, but I think there's something deeper at work here. <clears throat> well, actually, I agreed with an awful lot of what he had to say into the identity of flesh and blood. I don't think Paul's concern there is to say physical does not inherit the kingdom of God. That's not his focus. However, it seems to me when Joel says that flesh and blood has to do with the old covenant uh, body, uh, that he overlooks the fact that that flesh and blood has to do with the natural body. Those are direct corollaries with one another. He has shifted from the, the natural body being this that has to be glorified and then all of a sudden he goes to flesh and blood being the body of Israel, the old, old covenant. I would also point out that as I see the text, the flesh and blood certainly is Israel as William so eloquently pointed out and others have. Uh, Paul says, have you begun in the flesh? Or having begun in the spirit, are you now perfected by the flesh? Having nothing to do with a biological uh, fleshly body or a spirit uh, separated from the body. Uh, Paul is talking about the flesh, as Joel so eloquently expressed it, being an expression of life under Torah versus spirit, life in Christ. I don't see how we can shift from the natural body all of a sudden to flesh and blood and see natural body somehow being related to an individual body versus a corporate body uh, in the exact same context. I think that's misapplication. And by the way, let me point this out. If we take flesh and blood there to be the, uh, the body of flesh, the body of Moses, if you please, as it's called in, uh, in the book of Jude, if we take the body of flesh and blood there to be the old covenant, then it very clearly places the resurrection of 1 Corinthians 15, the final resurrection, the end of the millennium resurrection, in the context of the putting away of the flesh and blood, i.e. the old body of Israel. So to suggest that flesh and blood, and I agree with them 100% there, that flesh and blood is not a reference to the biological body. It's the old covenant body of Israel after the flesh. Okay, the resurrection of 1 Corinthians 15 would be putting off the body of flesh and blood. 
But the putting off of the body of flesh and blood is putting off the old covenant world of Israel. Therefore, the resurrection of 1 Corinthians 15 would be the putting off the old body, uh, the body of flesh and blood of old covenant Israel. And there you have it, folks. Yeah. Sorry. So uh, I did want to uh, just mention here, uh, obviously you see it. So Joel made our case. Joel makes the case in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 that the flesh and blood there is talking about the old covenant system. But then only a couple of verses later, does he now want to switch natural, which Don said, nat the natural body corresponds to the flesh and blood. So if Joel's willing to admit that flesh and blood is talking about the old covenant system, then unfortunately he has to give up the next couple of verses and realize that the transition was from the natural, again, a natural covenant, flesh and blood system that was given to old covenant Israel, and that there would be a spiritual body, that the Lord could raise up children of Abraham out of these stones which again is showing a spiritual new covenant that we see in the book of Galatians. The apostle Paul explains for us, how does one become a child of Abraham then? If it's not about coming out of the womb, again, we might even attach this to the discussion between Jesus and Nicodemus. Well, how does a man become born again? How do I become born of Abraham? I thought I was of Abraham. I'm of the flesh and blood of Abraham. Well, no, you must be a part of the spiritual identity of Abraham. How does one get that? Jesus Christ. If you are in Jesus Christ, you are children of Abraham. That's what the Apostle Paul says right there in Galatians chapters three and four. So again, hopefully you see Don just so well kind of brought it together. And I would agree with Joel McDermott. So right there, you have a partial preterist. Note this, folks. A partial preterist saying 1 Corinthians 15, the uh, flesh and blood is talking about the old covenant system. Just remember that. Because now when we talk to another futurist or partial preterist, we should already have that one done. Again, unless they're going to dispute that. And then that brings us to a whole other issue. And you'll, you'll notice this. The partial preterist community is guilty of this. They have a host of different views in regards to the flesh and blood of 1 Corinthians 15, which also, in my estimation, corresponds to what we read in 2 Corinthians chapters 3 through 5. Uh, it's going to be the same point being made. Uh, so, you know, that's why when some have said to me, uh, many of you know I've talked about this before, uh, I was removed from a pastor's meeting for saying that I believe that the the body, absent from the body, uh, in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, is talking about the Old Covenant. We have it right here that Joel McDermott is agreeing that there was an Old Covenant body, an Old Covenant identity, flesh and blood identity that's being marked out in these resurrection texts as being done away with. So just notice that. Notice, you know, again, he makes our case for us. Uh, let's go ahead and continue. I got a couple more clips I want to share with you. Uh, the next one is going to talk about the end. This one, wait till you catch the confusion going on here. And this is at the 37 minute mark of the Q&A. Bear with me, it's not as easy as it looks. All right. Circles there or not. Oh, sorry, 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 sorry. The question is, uh, and it's probably one of the best questions I've seen. Um, if the last day of John, which is exclusive to his language is to be in our own future and yet in the the epistles of john for first john chapter 2 i believe 218 uh, is talking about the coming of antichrist and he says now dear children this is the last hour and and the implication is if there's a last day then the last hour obviously is a subset of that last day and it's even shortened even more and he was expecting it in his time period in fact he says these antichrists are coming and now are so he was clearly talking about his time point and that is uh, on the surface does pre present a conundrum but if you go back to the overarching framework that i'm working with that you can have near fulfillments of these things and so you can apply language that on the near side and yet what is the controlling narrative it is is the curse removed from the earth and if it's not, then you can take both of those and move them into the future. Now, I realize that drags up other things like future Antichrist, future Armageddons. Um, we can deal with that if you want to, but that's basically how I would view that. Um, on the surface, it looks like a conundrum, but it's not insurmountable. I would clearly disagree with the fact that it's not insurmountable. Uh, John is very consistent in his eschatological concepts. Notice back in John chapter 5, 28 uh, or 24 and following. He talks about the hour that now is, 
when the dead shall hear the voice of the Son of Man, and they shall live. He says, then the hour is coming. Now, here's what an interesting thing takes place uh, in, in Joel's paradigm. He, he suggested to us the other night, whichever night it happened to have been, uh, that because it's an hour coming, that it cannot be the same kind of resurrection related to the resurrection of verse 24 and 25, that it must therefore uh, involve a period of thousands of years so far. I would suggest to you that this, this uh, fails to understand that obviously a, the, a, the initiation of the resurrection had begun. He would agree with that, and I don't know if I can find this or not. There, there are not two resurrections in John 5. There is a resurrection that had begun, was beginning, a resurrection to be consummated. Notice he doesn't shift from the nature at all. Those who are dead, those are in the grave. So what's the difference? Notice that he talks about those who hear the voice of the Son of Man shall live. Well, don't marvel, marvel at this, for the hour is coming in which all shall hear. This is not a shift or a change in the nature of the resurrection. Once again, it is the initiation awaiting consummation. Now, Joel will admit that the new creation was initiated in AD 70, but that we still await the consummation. Well, Christ was the second Adam, the new creation begun. In Colossians 1.15, as I pointed out, he was the uh, firstborn of the new creation. Well, what So again, you, you know, we, we see this constant confusion here. I might have started at the wrong point that I, I wanted, but um, hopefully you see the point there with uh, Joel's argumentation about the last day, the end. He seems to want to, one of my problems with Joel's position in this debate, at least, would be that he qualifies the importance of AD 70, but then in every other argument, he kind of overrides AD 70. I haven't quite understood how and why AD 70 needed to happen. If you were resurrected in Christ by believing in Jesus Christ, what was the point of AD 70 other than the judgment and the resurrection that would be attached to Christ's ministry? Uh, you know, these men, what they're trying to say is, yeah, yeah, AD 70, because of time statements, you have to be consistent. He was speaking to that time. But that wasn't the resurrection or the judgment. Why not? That, that's exactly what's going on. What Don's saying is in John 5, for example, and this has been brought up in debates with me, Jesus says that the resurrection now is and will be. There, you know, there's a resurrection that now is and there's a resurrection that will be. Many of you that are familiar with my teachings, I've explained this very simply. There's people that are alive that can put their faith in Jesus Christ. That's the now is portion. You can put your faith in Jesus Christ and you can go from death to life, John 5, 24. However, when we get to 1 Corinthians 15 and these other resurrection texts, we see they're waiting, another, they're waiting for a resurrection. So how can there be a resurrection and then there be waiting for a resurrection? Well, very simply, who are the people that cannot believe in Jesus? The dead ones, the old covenant dead. That would have been very important to the Jewish mind. So what about them? What about Moses, David, Abraham, all these people? How did they participate in this glorious reality of eternal life? Well, they have to be resurrected. And obviously they couldn't be resurrected by putting their faith in Jesus. So there had to come a day. What day was it? AD 70 is the coming of the Lord is when the resurrection of the dead would happen. So again, hopefully you see these men are putting themselves in a strange conundrum where they're agreeing. That's why I, I hate the, uh, you know, I, I hate to say hate, but I do. I hate that partial preterist distinction. You're a futurist trying to be consistent. Preterism, full preterism is showing consistency, the power of preterism. Let me go ahead and share with you a couple more clips. Uh, I realize I messed up that clip, by the way. I apologize. Uh, that was supposed to be 25 to 30. Uh, it was supposed to be a 10-minute clip. I kind of jumped in on two portions. But I'm going to go ahead and share this last clip with you here. Uh, this talks about the last days. And you know that phrase, that pesky phrase many people uh, find in 1 Corinthians 15, where it says, and then God will be all in all. Let me go ahead and read it to you, matter of fact. Let's jump over to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, because I've heard this brought up, and I thought Don, in this presentation, this answer here, he did a great job. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Let's go ahead and start at verse 22, because I believe that's where this uh, full context is picking up. And by the way, it should be bringing your mind back to Psalm 110. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ all shall be made alive, but each in his own order. Christ, the first fruits, 
after that, those who are Christ at his coming. Then comes the end, when he delivers up the kingdom to God and the Father, when he has abolished all rule, all authority, and power. For he must reign until he has put all of his enemies under his feet. The last enemy that will be abolished is death. For he has put all things in subjection under his feet. But when he says all things are put in subjection, it is evident that he is accepted who put all things in subjection to him. And when all things are subject to him, then the son himself also will be subject to the one who subjected all things to him, that God may be all in all. So for some folks, that's a perplexing question, but let's go ahead and hear what Joel and Don uh, offered up as their explanation of this text. And this is at hour, one hour and four minutes into the Q&A. Uh, what is my exegesis of 1 Corinthians 15, 28? That is, I'll read the whole verse. They only reference the part of it, but I'll read the whole verse. And when all things shall be subdued unto him, then shall the Son also be subject unto him that put all things under him, that God may be all in all. And the question was, what is my vision of what all, number one, when will God be all in all? And what does that look like? that God will be all in all. And I, I gotta say, in the big picture, I've got no idea. And that is my very highly studied theological, almost PhD opinion on that. <laughs> yeah, you know, when we start talking about these kind of speculative ideas, well, what's that gonna look like? Or what was God doing before creation? You remember the, the story about St. Augustine, one of his pupils asked him, what was God doing before he created the world? And Augustine responded by saying he was creating hell for curious students. <laughs> so I, I think we are rushing into places where angels dare to tread. When did this happen? Again, I, I can see a definitive fulfillment in Christ himself. But then I can also see aspects and applications of it in AD 70. But has Christ therefore turned over the king, team to the Father? If he has, then he's no longer interceding for anyone. And if he's no longer interceding for anyone, then how does anyone come to the Father? Therefore, why evangelize? Therefore, all those other practical issues that come out, and these are not just uh, full preterism's truth, and then this must be scary. These are real practical concerns. I mean, if all that is true up in the hell of realm, this is done, it's over with, God is all in all now then there are no more enemies of God. How can sin exist anywhere in the universe? What about Ephesians 4? All of the offices are gone because the place is perfected. We don't need to be teaching each other. And Don, I believe, turns that backwards on its head and says, oh, no, they have to be taught before they're in. But no, at this point, it's all in all. And it says they shall no more be taught. They shall no more teach one another. So... How do you get they have to teach one another out of they shall no more teach one another? I don't understand that. Uh, so I look at this and I say, no, there's obviously some definitive fulfillment of this or some final fulfillment of this in the future. And again, I look at my overall scheme, definitive in Christ, progressive in history, final at some point in the future. And that's why I would say, and what's that going to look like in the future? I've got no idea. So I want you to notice this now. Joel McDermott has no idea what God all in all looks like, but he knows the full preterist is wrong because he brought up all these other places and assertions that he believes, which obviously the full preterist can explain and has explained. But here in this debate in 2012, Joel McDermott is saying that he doesn't know uh, what all in all meant. And however, because of the things that he's propped up, uh, what was it, fulfilled in Christ, uh, something in history, and then there's a definite end. Because of these presuppositions he's fostered that he believes he can't even respond to and bolster with scripture, uh, you'll see that through the debate, uh, because he believes these things, and because historic Christianity has believed these things uh, on often propagated mistruth, um, because historic Christianity has believed all these things, the reason I say that, by the way, is because, yes, 
historical Christianity believed a lot of presuppositional thoughts, very varied across the different minds and uh, that were in different places throughout church history. Um, most people have not engaged church history. They have just kind of cited it and pulled things that might agree with their view. That's why every view under the sun has a church father or some church writers that agree with them. So don't allow that to kind of sway you here. So what we're asking Joel is, Joel, so you say that because full preterism has to be wrong because God is obviously, obviously not all in all yet. What is all in all? And he doesn't know. So hopefully you notice that. Now let's hear what Dr. Preston had to say. I'd like to point out that uh, in 1 Corinthians 15, Paul is not only drawing from Isaiah and Hosea and Daniel, but he's also drawing very, very heavily from the book of Zechariah. I'd like to point out that in Zechariah chapter 14, it begins with the prediction of the coming of the Lord, just as Paul is discussing a prediction of the coming of the Lord. It is a time of the coming of salvation. It is a time, notice, uh, if you will, verse 8 and following, it shall be in that day that living waters shall flow from Jerusalem, half of them toward the eastern sea, half of them toward the western sea. In both summer and winter it shall occur. Now, this is very clearly a picture of the river of life. This is a resurrection motif. Ezekiel chapter 47 speaks of the river of life flowing out from under the throne. Well, here you have the river of life flowing out from Jerusalem, which is where the throne was. And by the way, to go back to a comment that Joel made the other night, that uh, if you espouse full preterism, it may, as some have lamentably, espoused universalism. I don't think that's a logical trip at all for Ezekiel chapter 47, although it talks about everywhere the river flows that it brings life. Verse 11 specifically and emphatically says the marshes and the subsidiaries thereof do not come to life. They don't get life. Just like Revelation chapter 21 depicts a situation outside the city where there are dogs and liars. Well, that's another issue. But the point of fact is here we have the river of life, which is Revelation 22. I would remind you once again that Joel has said that this Zion, this new creation, came down from God out of heaven in AD 70. Okay, here we have the river of life. Back to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 20. Uh, verse 28, God being all in all. Verse 9, and the Lord shall be king over all the earth. In that day it shall be the Lord is one and his name one. Here is a direct prophecy of 1 Corinthians 15, 28. Zechariah emphatically places it within the context of the judgment of old covenant Israel, the coming of the Lord with all of his saints. Revelation puts this at the end of the millennium. Same prophecy, 1 Corinthians 15, was to be fulfilled in the putting off the body of the flesh of old covenant Israel. Just like Zechariah, coming to the Lord in judgment of Israel. They were ready to begin the second hour of... Okay, so I don't know about you, but listening to Don, that definitely made me want to uh, become more familiar with uh, what we read there in uh, Zechariah chapter 14 you know, beautiful text that Don brought us to. Uh, and hopefully you saw the problem there. So Joel doesn't know what all in all looks like. We, the full preterist community, Don Preston particularly in this debate, knows what all in all looks like. Why? Because he goes back to the Old Testament. He doesn't prop up his own presuppositions about history and what he believes needs to happen in the end. He reads the end. Most of us would agree the end is when the new Jerusalem, the new heavens and new earth is formed. The new Jerusalem comes out of the sky. Mind you, as Don just pointed out, Joel McDermott believes that happened in AD 70. Okay. Joel McDermott believes the new Jerusalem, the new heavens and new earth is a reality that happened in AD 70. But then yet he still wants to prop a future fulfillment of other Bible prophecies that he, he believes need to happen. Notice this. I love what Don did. So Don said, okay, 1 Corinthians 15. Uh, what other texts speak about this all in all? Obviously, this is a great correlation here in Zechariah 14. But another thing he did was leaned upon another presupposition we all agree upon. We agree that the resurrection of the dead, well, again, I think this, for some folks, this might not be the case. Uh, the resurrection of the dead will happen at the time of the new heavens and new earth, right? At the That's what the whole point of the resurrection of the dead is, so that we would all live in a new heavens and new earth. So what Don does is he takes you from 1 Corinthians 15, takes you over to Revelation chapter 22, the fulfillment of it, 
um, of this resurrection and this new heavens and new earth text. And then he shows you, he says, okay, well, if you don't believe that that's the resurrection, well, Ezekiel chapters 37 through 47 are speaking about the time of resurrection. And in that resurrection, you read about this temple that would be created and the water that would flow from it, very similar to what we read in Revelation 21 through 22. So you see correlation between Revelation 21 and 22 and Ezekiel 37 through 47. Now, I don't know any scholar for that matter that wouldn't see the correlation between 1 Corinthians 15 and Ezekiel 37, a resurrection text. So then what Don did was he said, okay, so if these are texts are all speaking about the same thing, Ezekiel 37 through 47, 1 Corinthians 15, Revelation 21 through 22, because of the similar language that we could see, this is not an erector set, folks, this is context. So what we see happening, and then obviously he brought us to Zechariah 14, and Zechariah 14 says it for us. It says that, you know, what does this all in all look like, right there in verse 9, and the Lord will be king over all the earth, and in that day the Lord will be the only one, and his name will be the only one. Now, obviously, there's people that say, well, there's idol worshipers everywhere. Because your view doesn't fit with what God's view is, that's not my problem. That is not the full preterist problem. Maybe you need to move away from this universal kingdom that people believe is going to happen on the planet one day that would totally do away with what God's view of it being fulfilled is. Uh, you know, again, so that's not my problem. I don't need to take up with that. This text tells us Ezekiel 37 through 47, Zechariah 14, Revelation 21 through 22. Those texts tell us what the ultimate end looks like. Now, again, there's all these different views that want to create aberrant interpretations. It just doesn't work. So that's where I'm at. You know, I, I really do. I think Don does a great job of wanting to help us develop our understanding of scripture. Don does a great job of bringing us back to the Old Testament texts as the context uh, that we need to be reading these New Testament promises in. Why? Because the Apostle Paul says that. He says that he preaches nothing other than that which was revealed in the law and the prophets. He preaches nothing other than the hope of Israel. He preaches nothing other than the covenant, the promises that were given to Israel of the flesh, Romans chapter 9. To what end? To what end? That's the question we need to ask ourselves. To what end did the Apostle Paul preach the gospel in light of the old covenant promises? Why did he preach this covenant of old covenant Israel coming to an end? Why did he preach the promises, the hope of that covenant? I'll show you. And I'm going to end here, gentlemen. So, uh, gentlemen and my sister here, if you want to uh, join with us uh, for a discussion, I'm going to conclude here in a moment. Romans 15, verse 8. For I say that Christ has become a servant to the circumcision, that's that old covenant of the flesh, on behalf of the truth of God to confirm the promises given to the fathers. Let's go ahead and continue into verse 9. And for the Gentiles to glorify God for his mercy. God has shown himself faithful to the promises he gave, and he's given us every reason to glorify his name. I hope that you've been edified by what I've brought forth so far. I'm going to go ahead and open the mics, hear what uh, others have to say in regards to our discussion this morning. Any questions, comments, concerns, please go ahead. If you see your mic unmuted, jump on in. Hey, Edward, I saw you writing feverishly to borrow a phrase from uh, Joel. <laughs> yes. You got um, okay. But he was talking about, um, let me see, the, the, the law, you know, still being in effect, basically. Um, and then he was like kind of uh, criticizing, you know, just criticizing um, Jesus of course, in Mark 12, 30, I believe what Jesus said, you know, love God with all your heart, mind, um, and strength, you know, and soul, of course, you know, and second, love your neighbor as yourself. And with all these, you know, everything hinged, the law, everything of the law hinged on that. Mm -hmm. So, you know, he's negating what Jesus had said, you know, what Jesus had said specifically. And then, what I can't understand is what he's talking about, you know, we're still under the curse because I'm sure Jesus had reversed the curse. Uh, I, I, I didn't have time to look, look up where Jesus had reversed the curse, you know, but, uh, you know, um, that's something too. And then I had, you know, written down, of course, Ezekiel 37 through 47 or something like that. And Zechariah 14, I have, 
you know, um, it's just so much information just to disprove what he was saying. But as he was trying to dis uh, discredit, um, he was saying a lot of things that that were true. Um, but but he's trying to um, have the truth, you know, fit his his um, paradigm. He's not letting the scripture say what the scripture is saying. You know, he's 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 saying things out of context. You know, when when John is using context, and he's like, you know, trying to dismantle what John is saying. Uh, he was. I, I don't think he did an effective job. I agree. I agree. I think he outlined, I think he has problem again. You, you marked out an interesting point there, Edward. Uh, when presenting your view, now again, Q and A is a little bit different. I shared the Q and A session with you. Uh, what Joel does is basically tries to dismantle what the full preterist believes without actually having an affirmative for his view, without actually having a good symphony to borrow a phrase he brings up in the debate. Uh, I don't think that he had that. I think he knows that. As many of you know, I've talked about being in communication with him. Um, I'm hoping that he might uh, further uh, help us understand his, maybe his evolved understanding in these things. Uh, hopefully he's worked in the last 10 years and uh, God willing, we'll hear from him a bit. I do know that he has, uh, I'm sure, challenged some of his views uh, and uh, maybe even has some responses different than what he would have said at this time with Don. So uh, again, I'm hoping to fan the flame of that discussion, but I agree with you, Edward. Uh, he does a horrible job of uh, demonstrating the case for his presuppositional view and uh, just kind of makes a tax on the creditor's view. Right, because I was I was looking for, for pictures of what he was describing, you know, with the truths in which he was giving. And basically, all I got was truths, true, but nothing connecting making a big picture, making a statement on a specific topic of resurrection, the set, Jesus coming, and things of this nature. You know, he, he didn't give a, a motif. <laughs> right. Yeah. He, what it is, unfortunately, what we see with Joel is he knows it's going to happen. He just doesn't know how it's going to happen. Yes. Uh, you'd ask, how do you know it's going to happen? But yeah. So uh, I'd encourage you, you know, if you haven't done the review of the debate, you'll get a lot of good morsels of truth and, and great syllogisms. I know you share my appreciation mm -hmm. for syllogisms. Uh, I encourage you to do that. Zach and Vicky, I see both of you are unmuted. Either one of you want to jump yes, in? Yes. Yes, Pastor. Yes, uh, Vicky. Uh, yeah. Flesh and blood cannot see the kingdom of God. Uh, there is a verse in Roman that now not all Israel are Israel of God. How is right. that? Amen. Well said. Well connected. That's exactly the point. Yeah. There was a cover. Yeah. Yeah. Anything else you want to share, that's Vicky? It. Well, great. No, that's it. Pastor. Amen. Well said. Yeah, that's what we're seeing in First Corinthians 15. I appreciate the way Don had outlined it there. Um, but yeah, what we're seeing in the, the, the flesh and blood, that language is speaking about old covenant Israel. And that's not to say that every time, let's be clear, uh, every time we see the word flesh, it doesn't mean it always means that. Sometimes it can mean the physical body. Sometimes it can be yeah. more of a, uh, uh, you know, I believe the carnal mind, the fleshly mind is still an enemy of people. So I don't believe that's only the old covenant. I believe the Gentiles also suffered from carnality. Uh, which I believe is exemplified through the biblical story. So again, I'm careful with the flesh and blood. However, I believe the larger context of what's going on in Corinthians, uh, namely the issues wow. between Jew and Gentile, uh, is simply being highlighted there in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Wow. But thank you. Is that all you had to share? Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you, Vicki. Uh, Zach, you have anything you wanted to share? Hey, good morning. Um... Yeah, again, a lot of this comes down to um, Joel McDermott seems to be bringing up a lot of consequences that he doesn't, he points to as being problematic with full preterism without, you know, giving a, an accurate account of what most full preterists believe about a lot of these things. Um, again, with that, I think it was the first clip, he's as uh, Edward was pointing out, he's talking about the law. And um, it really is sort of a caricature, sort of legalistic argument about what the law was and what it means 
for us as people who have um, who are under a new covenant and um, where the old covenant has become obsolete. Um, I mean, he seemed to be saying that, you know, <laughs> that we would, you would say that you, you would no longer have to, or should not, or I don't know, I don't know 100% understand what you're saying, love your neighbor as yourself if Christ has come. Like, um, which is, again, it's, it's, it's a sort of a perverse legalism, not saying that he's perverse, but um, the idea that unless you are bound by a law to do something, then there's no reason to do it. And um, I, I just think that's, that's a misuse of the law. I think a lot, a lot of people on both sides, um, there's two really types of legalism. There's people who are obsessed with telling you what you don't have to do and people who are obsessed with telling you what you do have to do. They're both legalists, um, but they're both missing the point. Um, the law was a tutor to teach us you know, various things. Um, one of those things is how to love our neighbors as ourselves um, and to love God with our whole hearts, minds, souls, and spirits. Um, those things are never going away. I, 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 and it sort of boggles the mind. I, I don't know if Joel McDermott would have said back then, you know, in my eschatology, in the future, when Christ comes back, then everybody's no longer to love God with all their heart, mind, soul, or spirit, and or love their neighbors by them as themselves. Um, I mean, he, he's, he's creating a scenario that doesn't exist in anybody's eschatology, and then applying it to full preterism. Mm -hmm. um, and he doesn't, I don't even think at that time he would have believed um, that proposition that somehow because the old covenant has become obsolete and has passed away that under the new covenant, that means you don't have to love your neighbor as yourself or that you shouldn't, or that you, you that it matters whether you've been bound by a law to do that. It's a wise and good and pleasing thing to to God to do, and you're going to do that in the new co new covenant, whether you're bound by the old covenant to do it or not. Um, so I, I just think that's a fallacious sort of legalism that, um, and again, it's a little bit disingenuous because nobody believes, not even partial preterists, you know, actually believe that. Um, and again, <laughs> Going forward to some of the other things he's talking about, he's talking about, um, you know, the curse not being removed. I, I would like to get your ideas. I, I didn't, I'll be honest, I didn't read or watch the entire debate, but um, I'm sure he discusses what he believes the curse to be. Um, and um, he clearly believes that it hasn't been fulfilled um, in his estimation. He brings up a lot of different, you know, consequences um, that he feels, or a lot of things that he feels have not been um, fulfilled in his estimation as to what, how they should be fulfilled. And I think it does come down to dissatisfaction in what God has provided for us. Um, and that I think with futurists leads to sort of excess in what they believe should happen. Um, they're just dissatisfied with what, what their lives and what life looks like now. And so they go beyond what the scriptures has taught us um, in a type of excess to say, well, we need more. Now, Joel McDermott, interestingly, can't Put his finger on exactly what he thinks should happen, um, but he is dissatisfied with with the way things are right now, and so that provides the foundation for saying, "Well, I, you cannot believe that you know all things, all prophecy has been fulfilled because you know you're you're sort of left with this world which I am dissatisfied with." Well. Again, that, that's 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 the, the common futurist, I think, 
feeling and emotion and psychology lying at the bottom of this, but you have to be, again, you, you must, you, you should let your expectations and your satisfaction be in Jesus Christ and what he has done and what he has provided and the word he has spoken to us. Um, and let that form you and form your expectations and your feelings and your hopes and for, you know, this world and this life. Um, and, you know, there's no response necessarily to that from Joel McDermott other than to say, well, this doesn't meet my expectations. So let's go beyond what the word of God says. Um, and I think that's a, I think this is very common, but again, I think it's excess um, on his part and the part of futurists to do that. Um, another thing I like to bring up briefly, and I would like to get um, anybody else's ideas on this, um, is his reference to like all of these offices being um, in sort of the, the latter clips, all of these offices being done away with. Like Christ apparently, he didn't say it explicitly, I guess will not be king or priest or mediator or intercessor. Um, and again, I don't know that he actually, <laughs> I, I, I mean, it's hard to say since he's sort of um, admitted that he doesn't know, can't really put his finger on what the future is going to look like, but I, I don't, I'm not aware of any even partial prayers or futurists who actually believe this, that in any eschatology, people say, oh, well, he's no longer going to be king. He's no longer going to be a priest. Um, he's never, he's no longer going to have all these offices. He's just going to, I don't know what he's, Christ is going to do in this future eschatology that he has um, in mind, but I, I just, it, it just reminds me of Hebrews where I, I believe it says that Christ will rem remains a priest in the order of Melchizedek um, forever. And I mean, correct me if I'm wrong about that, but, um, and a Mel Melchizedek priest is a priest king and he's going to be in that order. He will remain in that order forever. And I, I, I think he seems to be going to, you know, 1 Corinthians 15, where I can't remember the exact verse where it talks about Christ, you know, must reign until he has put all of his enemies under his feet. But again, people are in the con when people are arguing full preterist, that's where they come to this verse and they say, you know, see, he's going to if he, if he's if he's already come, then and he's put all enemies of an, under his feet. He's no longer king based on this verse. But I don't even think partial preterists believe that. I think it's just something they pull out when they're arguing with full preterists and say, um, well, he's not, you must be saying he's not king anymore. Well, I don't, I'm not saying that. Um, I don't think the scripture says that. Um, I think that's a misuse of the word until in that verse to say that he ceases to be king upon when, once he's put all of his enemies under his feet. Um, but again, I don't even think that Partial preterists will believe that in the future, sometime Christ will cease to be king um, or priest. Um, it just seems like something they bring out when they're trying, when they're, you know, wrangling with full preterists. And I think that's, again, I think that's a disingenuous argument to make. But I would like to get your ideas on this idea that, like, Christ will, like, give up every office and, and title that he has um, in the New Covenant, because I just don't think that's a biblical worldview. Yeah, yeah. If I may respond to a couple of things you brought up, Zach, I think you brought up some great points. Um, the first thing, uh, Joel, I agree with uh, how Joel's sort of categorizing the curse and his sort of presuppositional views as to what he expects in the future uh, as a problem in the debate. Uh, it's all throughout the debate. Uh, one thing he offered up to further qualify what you said was that his wife could never become a full preterist because she knows the pain of child labor. And we know that we have this argument again and again and again. Um, so, uh, even Don brought up the point, well, it says increased pain. So that would mean it was pain. And, and Don did a great job of going back to Genesis. And if I may sort of sum up Don's apologetic against that is what Don would show. I have it written down here in my notes. He would show that Genesis two through three is correlating the first Corinthians 15. 
And Joel would agree. We, we hear him attaching those same curses that you see in Genesis 2 through 3 to the necessity of resurrection in 1 Corinthians 15. So, and again, I think most scholars across the board would generally agree with that. Uh, Genesis 2 through 3 is speaking to the same resurrection that 1 Corinthians 15 is speaking about. Why? Because as that very first verse that I mentioned, I think it's 1 Corinthians 15, 23, where it says, as in Adam, all die. So in Christ, all we made alive. So it brings our attention back to what's going on with Adam. So Genesis 2 through 3 equals 1 Corinthians 15. Then what Don would show you is that 1 Corinthians 15 is also borrowing from Isaiah chapters 24 through 28. And when you see that, okay, so whatever Isaiah 24 through 28 is speaking about, that's also part and parcel of 1 Corinthians 15. And then therefore, by syllogistic logic, that would mean that whatever's going on in Isaiah 24 through 28, the text of resurrection that's used by the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians 15, is also the resurrection that would have been hoped for by, in Genesis 2 through 3. So Don kind of brings you through all of that and unpacks it in a biblical fashion, a scripture alone fashion, rather than uh, getting into some of the muck that, uh, you know, that might come up from presuppositional argumentation. Now, that being said, let's deal with one that you brought up, the mediating. So the futurist view, the partial preterist view, and again, uh, you've probably noticed this as well, Zach, a lot of the partial preterist arguments get propped up when they come into these debates with futurists. Like, for example, I mean, with preterists, excuse, uh, excuse me, like I'll bring, I'll give an example. I had never heard of the eternal incarnation of Christ until I started debating mm -hmm. futurists, where now all of a sudden there's a futurist that believe, yeah, you, you know, and they'll bring up all these confessions and creeds and arguments that you have to believe Christ was eternally incarnate. And again, there's some differences that could get into in regards to the Jewish understanding of the Memra and, um, you know, who was Jesus before he put on flesh, uh, different things like that, obviously leaning in on Trinitarian discussions. Um, so that's what they sort of try to do there. Uh, now, I've seen this happen again and again. I see this happening with this mediator argument as well. So I might respond to it like this. Uh, Jesus came as a mediator, uh, you know, to mediate the lives. What is mediation? To create, you know, to bring restoration, to restore a relationship. And we know that Christ became a mediator first to the Jew. The Jew was the one that violated the old covenant. So they needed to be mediated. Christ in his incarnational work, what is he doing? Going to Jews, preaching the gospel, not saying that he didn't preach to Gentiles. There's plenty of evidence of that. But the apostles went on to do that work. They offered up the mediation that Christ had offered through his sacrifice to Jew and Gentile. That was the sort of, you know, that's the, what is it? We are ministers of reconciliation, uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 3. So now what the futurist wants to argue is that when Christ mediate, when Christ ascended into heaven, he continues to do the mediation, which I would agree. And they believe that the only way he's able to do that mediation in heaven is that he's retained a physical body. And then this gets fostered by the day that he, when he comes, and I guess he's on earth, the mediation is done. Everything is this sort of universal utopia. And, um, and all the bad people have, are burning in hell. You know, that's kind of, it depends what futurist you talk to, of course. Um, and that's kind of what they want to uh, posit. Now, Alan Bondar in his book, The Journey Between the Veils, he got in on this argument quite a bit about this mediation of Christ. And I believe that Christ is still mediator. He's still doing mediatorial work through his body, the church, and, uh, and bringing others to reconciliation with God. So um, yeah, I, I think, and hopefully that made sense. I think it's just a false assumption that's offered up. Um, and it's based on presupposition rather than on Christ's work. And as you said, you know, I don't know any futurist view that says one day Jesus is no longer going to be mediator. And obviously what happens is, is we don't get after them on that comment. We let them keep using that against us. Uh, you know, uh, same thing with, well, I believe all of them would believe Jesus is always going to be king, but he's going to be king over a sort of universalist utopia um, that runs against what I see in obviously Zechariah 14, uh, Ezekiel 4, 37 through 47, and Revelation 21 through 22. So uh, did that respond to your question, Zach? It did, and it's helpful. I mean, again, he is a mediator of a better covenant. He's a mediator of the new covenant. That's right. Okay, the new covenant's not coming to an end. I, I don't understand. I mean, it, it, a lot of times, as you pointed out, I think they, they conflate, you know, the... Um, the coming of Christ in 87 with the end of, the, you know, the new covenant. And that's just not what we believe. And, I, and again, I don't think it's what they believe um, would happen in the future. Um, so again, as you, 
as we've talked about, like they trot out some of these um, arguments that they would never apply to their own eschatology and use it as a critique of us, which um, again, I think it's, I think it's disingenuous. Amen. It is, it is. And, and, you know, I imagine Joel may have grown in his view, may have changed some of the things the way he would explain that. That might be one of the things I am going to send this video to him and hope he might review this and share some insights with me, at least in private, uh, to how he would respond to some of these points. So uh, thank you. And I hope that, you know, yeah, we'll, thanks. We're finding clarity as we're studying through these things. Yes. I also wanted to address when he spoke about the soul and then the spirit and stuff like that. Because what, I, what I've learned from you about the soul, the soul is your being. You are a soul, a, a, a living soul. Now, when you shed the body, you know, the spirit of Christ, if you're saved, you know, and if you're the elect of God and you have the Holy Spirit, which is that resurrection power, that gives your soul the ability to, uh, to be immortal um, because the soul can die. There's scriptures that talks about how the soul can die, but um, mm -hmm. for the spirit, for the soul to become immortal, it has to have that Holy Spirit indwelling in you to, to give that, that soul that eternal life. And then um, also um, when it talks about uh, the curse, the curse being reversed, I found you know several verses that speak to that. Uh, I currently have on um, Romans 5, 11 through 21, six verse, uh, 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 chap chapter 6, 23, uh, verse 23. I have um, John 4, 6 through 15. Uh, I believe that's basically the scriptures that I have speaking to that. Um, just the, um, just 11, of, of Romans 5 kind of speaks to it, even though it goes to uh, 21. But let me, let me read uh, 11, which states, and not only this, but we also celebrate in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received the reconciliation. You know, then it goes on and it talks about that, you know. Therefore, just as through one man sin, uh, entered into the world and death through sin. And so death spread to all mankind because of, because all sin and unto the law, uh, sin was uh, in the world, but sin is not counted against anyone when there is no law. You know, of course, you know, then it goes on, of course, but it's, it talks about, you know, the curse, you know, Jesus Christ, you know, um, ending it, you know, by reconciliation, you know, uh, am I right? Yeah, well, I would generally agree. I would agree with you. Um, I think I want to highlight what Joel was getting at with the uh, soul. Mm. What you're bringing up is a little bit different of a discussion. Um, oh. what, what Joel was highlighting here in 1 Corinthians 15, I'll bring our attention there. Uh, in 1 Corinthians 15, I'm going to read from verse 35. Uh, through verse 50. And I want to kind of make the point that Don was making and that Joel was trying to make. But someone will say, how are the dead raised? And with what kind of body do they come? You fool, that which you sow does not come to life unless it dies. And that which you sow, you do not sow the body which is to be, but a bare grain, perhaps of wheat or of something else. But God gives it a body just as he wished to each of the seeds, a body of its own. All flesh is not the same flesh, but there is one flesh of men and another of fish of beasts and another flesh of birds and another of fish. There are also heavenly bodies and earthly bodies, but the glory of the heavenly one and the glory of the earthly one is another. There is one glory of the sun and another glory of the moon and another glory of the stars, for stars differ from stars in glory. So also is the resurrection of the dead. It is raised a perishable body. It is sown a perishable body, excuse me. And it is raised an imperishable body. It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. It is sown a natural body. It is raised a spiritual body. If there is a natural body, there is a spiritual body. So as it is written, the first man, Adam, 
became a living soul. The last Adam became a life-giving spirit. The first man is from the earth, earthy. The second man is from heaven. As is the earthy, so also are those who are earthy. As is the heavenly, so are those who are heavenly. Just as we have borne the image of the earthy, we also shall bear the image of the heavenly. Now I say this, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the imperishable inherit the imperishable. So what was going on here, the language that they were using, what Joel began to explain was the body language. Now notice this, Joel connected 1 Corinthians 50, 15, verse 50 to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 42, which shouldn't shock us because it's right here in the same passage. Now, to the natural reader, this might not be noticeable here. It is sown a natural body. This is, um, what's the word? Uh, Sukikos, the soulish body, the natural body, the body that was defined by the life that God had given, but that can die. Right Again, hopefully you see a picture of the old covenant. God gave a glory. This is further explained, by the way, in 2 Corinthians 3 through 5, that there was a glory to the old covenant. Uh, now, that old covenant could die. That old covenant, covenant would vanish away. How many times do we need to see that in the scriptures? Hebrews 8, for example, uh, it was getting ready to vanish away, the old covenant. So the old covenant is this sukikos, this soulish body. As you marked out, Edward, the soul can die. It's the flesh and blood body of old covenant Israel if we properly correlate it to verse 50. Flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Why? Because it dies. Now, the opposite of that is the pneumaticos, the spiritual body. And the spiritual body is a body that cannot die. That's what you would be raised into. And we know the larger question, and I'm doing a study on Tuesday nights, which we alluded to here, uh, where we're going through resurrection texts. When you understand 1 Corinthians 15, the larger question that's happening here is, Okay, well, we get resurrection life by believing in Jesus, but what about the dead ones? And there began this heresy in Corinth where some were saying the dead ones would not be raised. And that's why the Apostle Paul is explaining here, well, no, there is a natural body, that natural identity. Yes, the uh, sukikos, but there's also a pneumaticos. And by the way, I explain a bit of this in my book, Wicked. Uh, if you get your hands on Wicked, I explain this in one of the chapters I get in on uh, the body of Adam, the body of the soul uh, versus the body of spirit, the body of Christ. So um, I encourage folks to look at that. So hopefully, Edward, that responded to your point. You made a good point about the soul being able to die, but I wanted you to see the larger context of what they're debating here and what Joel yes. up about the soulish body and the spiritual body. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, yes. And we will be getting to that on Tuesday nights, by the way, uh, 1 Corinthians 15. It's a bit away, but we're getting there. You might get, I might wet your senses with this, we might actually get to 1 Corinthians 15 quicker in our Sunday sermons at the Blue Point Bible Church than we will in our resurrection study happening on Tuesday nights. So you'll have two opportunities to see 1 Corinthians 15 soon in our crazy Corinthian sermon series at Blue Point, and then, of course, in our resurrection of the dead study on Tuesday night. So uh, you'll have ample opportunity to really see that drawn out a bit more than our conversation this morning. Did I give you an opportunity to... Um to adjust the uh, curse reversed? Well, I'd say the curse reversed is Revelation 21 through 22. There's no more curse. What okay. Are you, what are you asking? <laughs> okay, 21 and 22. Uh, you know, you read through it and, and it'll say no more curse? Oh, yeah, exactly. It'll say no more curse right there. Uh, and I might encourage you, read Genesis 2 through 3. And we did this study, by the way, if you remember. Yeah. On, nice. Read Genesis 2 through 3. Read Isaiah 65 which is a good Old Testament picture of what they were hoping for. And then read Revelation 21 through 22, and you'll see the curse removed. Mm -hmm. So uh, I hope you might do that study on your own. Yes. All right. Well, I'm going to go ahead. I know we went a little bit over our hour. We're almost getting closer to a two-hour hour. Pastor. Vicky. Pastor. Vicky. Yeah, Pastor. Hi, Vicky. <laughs> okay. The, sum, the bottom line of the latter part of First Corinthians 15 is the elect of God are always spiritual. Yes, the new covenant uh, is a spiritual covenant. No, the, the elect of God is spiritual, eternal, and and they have they possess ever uh, eternal life. Yes, As you read now it, bec it become more clear to me. Yes. 
And the physical is the old covenant. Right. And the natural. Natural. Okay? A better word to use there is natural. That's it, that's it Pastor. That's it. Okay, <laughs> so well, simple, you know? It is. You're very right, Vicki. Uh, it's very simple. What I would say, I try to be careful with certain phrases. For example, we know in the preterist community, there's divisions. Yeah. Uh, for example, the elect of God. The elect of God yes. continues to be a problematic phrase for folks uh, in the preterist community. So I try here with our preterist power hour to speak a bit more generally. Now, I would agree the elect is the new covenant people. Now, some wouldn't agree with that. So I like to say to kind of keep us in a broad uh, frame of reference right now, I would say the new covenant is what that spiritual body is. The elect of God can cause the problem. Okay. So, uh, yeah. I would, Please I would, repeat that, Pastor. That's wonderful. Repeat that. The the spiritual body is the church or something. The you covenant say? is the spiritual body. The covenant yeah. is the spiritual body. Okay. Yeah. okay. Very well said, Vicky. It, Thank you. Okay. The church is spiritual bodies. That's right. It's a spiritual body. Because I did look up uh, the church uh, being given all power and authority. <laughs> In right. Ephesians 1, and, and Matthew 28, 18 through 20. That's right. Yeah, the church has been given the <laughs> I dirt. like summary. I like summary. <laughs> Amen. Well, I'm glad. Thank you for your summarizing thoughts. Yeah. All right, well, I'm gonna go ahead and start bringing us to a close. I thank you for being here this morning. I can see that some of us don't wanna leave. <laughs> um, that said, uh, let me go ahead and just share some couple of announcements with you uh, as I close out our program for today. Um, I did mention that we're gonna go ahead and look back at the 2022 Spirit and Life Lectures. So uh, if you're on Facebook, you might start digging them up. I might work toward a blog update for next Monday uh, where you could go back and listen to each of those lectures at your own leisure. And again, I might try to welcome some speakers uh, from that conference. Uh, we've already let the cat out of the bag. Uh, we're continuing our study uh, Tuesday nights, the contextual study of the hope of Israel, resurrection of the dead. We've journeyed from Genesis up to the book of Hosea. We've actually completed Hosea. And this coming Tuesday, we're moving in on Isaiah chapter 24. So uh, we hope that you might consider joining with us 7.30 p.m. Eastern uh, on Tuesday nights. And uh, we'll be there studying Isaiah 24 this week. And as many of you know, we'll be staying there for a bit. Isaiah 24 through 28 is a rather, rather large portion, very much highlighted, by the way, in the Don Preston debate with Joel McDermott. Uh, so it'll be a great, on the heels of that debate, it'll be great to study through these things. And um, we hope you might consider joining with us. Edward Howell, who you heard from this morning, also has a blog available. Ed Howell, or I'm sorry, Thinking Through Theology, edhowell.wordpress.com. Uh, we have that link available for you at the Power of Preterism Network. I uh, hope you might visit his blog and learn some of his recent gleanings. Uh, many of you know I often bring up Daniel Rogers. Brother Daniel Rogers uh, writes a great blog, danielr.net. Makes it very simple for you. He has some great blogs he's been writing recently, really, in my estimation, leaning in on what we talked about at the beginning. The goal of our faith is this, love from a pure heart, a good conscience, and a sincere faith. Uh, Daniel is also publishing a book this year, this in the next couple months. Um, so I hope that you might keep an eye out for it. Uh, I'm forgetting the name off the top of my head. I think it's how a 25 year old boy realized he wasn't the only one going to heaven. I think I might've just given it to you. Uh, but again, a great read, hopefully. Uh, I'm imagining Daniel's always been a blessing. So I encourage you to go over there, get his resources. Um, something I have to make mention of an upcoming opportunity for some folks. So just bear with me one second as I dig it up here. I'm gonna share a graphic on the screen. Many of us remember Dr. Cindy Coates of Present Truth. She has a podcast. She's going to be speaking in Crestwood, Kentucky on Thursday, September 1st at 3 p.m. She's hosting, uh, it's right near Louisville, Kentucky, by the way. Uh, it's going to be a fulfilled eschatology seminar, uh, again, hosted by Dr. Cindy Coates. Uh, she hosts the podcast, Present Truth Matters. So if you're in that area and you're able to be a part of that conference, uh, that's Camp Crestwood Christian Camp Conference and Retreat Center. We encourage you to go there, be there with her. Uh, find her on Facebook, Cindy Coates, and uh, be encouraged by the resources that she will be providing. Uh, and also go ahead and listen to her podcast, uh, Present Truth Matters. Uh, I've shared with you uh, Preterist Gear. We've had uh, Maurice Rogers join with us for a program. I saw some neat shirts that Preterist Gear put out this past week. If you're looking for some new uh, t-shirts to wear that help promote full preterism, go ahead and visit preteristgear.com. He has far more than t-shirts though. So if you're looking for anything else, maybe a gift to give someone, 
go ahead and visit preterestgear.com. Uh, use some of the, uh, those resources to bless yourself and bless others. Lastly, last announcement I'll share with you this morning would be um, Fulfilled Media. Fulfilled Media, Preter Preterist Voice continues to be somebody I bring up, his resources. He actually is the behind the scenes uh, administrator for Dr. Don K. Preston, those of you that didn't know that. And uh, Preterist Voice often brings up some great ideas and insights. Uh, fulfilled Media is one of those things right now. If you go to Google, put in fulfilledmedia.com, uh, you'll be able to find a host of different videos from myself and other Preterist teachers. I want to give you an exciting announcement that was announced this morning. Heads up, ministry leaders, Fulfilled Media is starting to plan its first annual Fulfilled Media Presents. What is that, you may ask? Fulfilled Media Presents will be an early spring presentation of digital teachings and lectures based on a theme for the year. We will invite various speakers to accept the challenge of presenting a lecture or teaching in video and or audio format on a topic of the theme. Each speaker will be given a time limit of 30 to 45 minutes to present his understanding of the topic he has agreed to speak on. Fulfilled Media will then compile these lectures into a complete presentation of the theme and make them available to the public for free. We will also provide these at a minimal price for your library. The theme for early spring 2023 will be Scripture Alone is the Muscle of Preterism. Invitations to participate are going out soon. If you have an interest in being a speaker, you should contact Alan Morton at here, if you're writing this down, podcast at fulfilledmedia.com. And you could be a part of that opportunity there. I know I've already been, uh, obviously I'm sharing it with you because they reached out to me. So I'll be putting together a message on scripture alone is the muscle of preterism. I look forward to working with Alan Morton in those regards and, and blessing you with the insights that are shared. And of course, there's so many more opportunities, insights, events, conferences, that are constantly being planned within the fulfilled community. We just simply have the pleasure of being your announcement guide, if you will. That's the goal with the Preterist Power Hour, to highlight past resources and to bring up upcoming opportunities and events. I hope that you continue to see that as a reality in your life, that you continue to be blessed by what we bring forth through the Power of Preterism Network. And if I might go ahead and bring you uh, close with a flashback Friday thought. If you remember the Don Preston, Steve Gregg debate, uh, Steve Gregg basically tried to posit that with full preterism and with all of his assumed presuppositions that he finds problematic with fulfilled thought, he said, it leads you to be up the creek without a paddle. Me, and although I kind of responded to that, and I'd like to say full preterism has made us up the creek with a paddle. In other words, living life in the fulfilled eschaton. Thank God for all that he has provided. He has truly made us his church like him. Let's go ahead and pray this morning. I thank you for being here with me for the Preterist Power Hour. And we will be here again Monday morning at 1030 a.m. Eastern for yet again another Preterist Power Hour. Let's pray out. Mighty God, we do thank you. We thank you for all that you've enriched us with. I thank you for the minds and hearts, Lord, you bring together for the Preterist Power Hour, whether they're here live with me or they're on Facebook or they watch after the fact, Lord, we thank you for your continued work. We thank you that you continue to uh, bring, you continue to bring forth reconciliation, Lord, uh, reconciliation uh, regarding us with you and then reconciliation regarding us and our neighbor and maybe even our neighbors and our neighbors. Uh, so Lord, we ask that you continue to propel us into the goal of our faith and allow us to truly relish all that we have in you, that you truly have provided all things pertaining to life and godliness, in that we would be effective and fruitful in our use of the knowledge of God. Thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless and go in peace.